Section 19 of The Wonderful Adventures of Nils. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Wonderful Adventures of Nils by Selma Lagerlöf. Translated by Velma Swanston Howard. The Big Bird Lake. Jarrow the Wild Duck. On the eastern shore of Vetten lies Mount Omberg. East of Omberg lies Dagmosse. East of Dagmosse lies Lake Token. Around the whole of Token spreads the big, even Östergöta plain. Token is a pretty large lake, and in olden times it must have been still larger. But then the people thought it covered entirely too much of the fertile plain, so they attempted to drain the water from it, that they might sow and reap on the lake bottom. But they did not succeed in laying waste the entire lake, which had evidently been their intention. Therefore it still hides a lot of land. Since the draining the lake has become so shallow that hardly at any point is it more than a couple of meters deep the shores have become marshy and muddy and out in the lake little mud islets stick up above the water's surface now there is one who loves to stand with his feet in the water if he can just keep his body and head in the air and that is the reed and it cannot find a better place to grow upon than the long shallow token shores and around the little mud islets it thrives so well that it grows taller than a man's height, and so thick that it is almost impossible to push a boat through it. It forms a broad green enclosure around the whole lake, so that it is only accessible in a few places where the people have taken away the reeds. But if the reeds shut the people out, they give in return shelter and protection to many other things in the reeds there are a lot of little dams and canals with green still water where duckweed and pondweed run to seed and where nut eggs and blackfish and worms are hatched out in uncountable masses all along the shores of these little dams and canals there are many well-concealed places where seabirds hatch their eggs and bring up their young without being disturbed by either enemies or food worries. An incredible number of birds live in the token reeds, and more and more gather there every year, as it becomes known what a splendid abode it is. The first to settle there were the wild ducks, and they still live there by thousands, but they no longer own the entire lake for they have been obliged to share it with swans, grebes, cots, loons, fenducks, and a lot of others. Token is certainly the largest and choicest bird lake in the whole country, and the birds may count themselves lucky as long as they own such a retreat. But it is uncertain just how long they will be in control of reeds and mud banks, for human beings cannot forget that the lake extends over a considerable portion of good and fertile soil, and every now and then the proposition to drain it comes up among them. And if these propositions were carried out, the many thousands of water birds would be forced to move from this quarter. At the time when Nils Holgersson travelled around with the wild geese, there lived at Token a wild duck named Jarro. He was a young bird who had only lived one summer, one fall, and a winter. Now it was his first spring. He had just returned from South Africa, and had reached Token in such good season that the ice was still on the lake. One evening, when he and the other young wild ducks played at racing backward and forward over the lake, a hunter fired a couple of shots at them, and Jarrow was wounded in the breast. He thought he should die, but in order that the one who had shot him shouldn't get him into his power, he continued to fly as long as he possibly could, 
He didn't think whither he was directing his course, but only struggled to get far away. When his strength failed him, so that he could not fly any farther, he was no longer on the lake. He had flown a bit inland, and now he sank down before the entrance to one of the big farms which lie along the shores of Token. A moment later a young farmhand happened along. He saw Jarrow and came and lifted him up. But Jarrow, who asked for nothing but to be let to die in peace, gathered his last powers and nipped the farmhand in the finger so he should let go of him. Jarrow didn't succeed in freeing himself. The encounter had this good in it at any rate. The farmhand noticed that the bird was alive. He carried him very gently into the cottage and showed him to the mistress of the house, a young woman with a kindly face. At once she took Jarrow from the farmhand, stroked him on the back, and wiped away the blood which trickled down through the neck feathers. She looked him over very carefully, and when she saw how pretty he was, with his dark green shining head, his white neckband, his brownish-red back, and his blue wing mirror, she must have thought that it was a pity for him to die. She promptly put a basket in order and tucked the bird into it. All the while Jarrow fluttered and struggled to get loose, but when he understood that the people didn't intend to kill him, he settled down in the basket with a sense of pleasure. Now it was evident how exhausted he was from pain and loss of blood. The mistress carried the basket across the floor to place it in the corner by the fireplace, but before she put it down, Jarrow was already fast asleep. In a little while Jarrow was awakened by someone who nudged him gently. When he opened his eyes, he experienced such an awful shock that he almost lost his senses. Now he was lost, for there stood the one who was more dangerous than either human beings or birds of prey. It was no less a thing than Caesar himself, the long-haired dog who nosed around him inquisitively. How pitifully scared had he not been last summer, when he was still a little yellow-down duckling, every time it had sounded over the reed-stems. Caesar is coming! Caesar is coming! When he had seen the brown and white-spotted dog, with the teeth-filled jowls, come wading through the reeds, he had believed that he beheld death itself. He had always hoped that he would never have to live through that moment when he should meet Caesar face to face. But to his sorrow he must have fallen down in the very yard where Caesar lived, for there he stood right over him. "'Who are you?' he growled. "'How did you get into the house? Don't you belong down among the reed banks?' It was with great difficulty that he gained the courage to answer. "'Don't be angry with me, Caesar, because I came into the house,' said he. "'It isn't my fault. I have been wounded by a gunshot. It was the people themselves who laid me in this basket.' "'Oho! Oho! So it's the folks themselves that have placed you here,' said Caesar. "'Then it is surely their intention to cure you, although for my part I think it would be wiser for them to eat you up since you are in their power. But, at any rate, you are tabooed in the house. You needn't look so scared. Now we are not down on token. With that Caesar laid himself to sleep in front of the blazing log fire. As soon as Jarrow understood that this terrible danger was past, extreme lassitude came over him, and he fell asleep anew. The next time Jarrow awoke, he saw that a dish with grain and water stood before him. He was still quite ill, but he felt hungry nevertheless, and began to eat. When the mistress saw that he ate, she came up and petted him, and looked pleased, and after that Jarrow fell asleep again. For several days he did nothing but eat and sleep. One morning Jarrow felt so well that he stepped from the basket and wandered along the floor. But he hadn't gone very far before he keeled over, and lay there. Then came Caesar, 
opened his big jaws and grabbed him. Jarro believed, of course, that the dog was going to bite him to death, but Caesar carried him back to the basket without harming him. Because of this, Jarro acquired such a confidence in the dog Caesar that, on his next walk in the cottage, he went over to the dog and lay down beside him. Thereafter Caesar and he became good friends, and every day for several hours Jarro lay and slept between Caesar's paws. But an even greater affection than he felt for Caesar did Jarro feel towards his mistress. Of her he had not the least fear, but rubbed his head against her hand when she came and fed him. Whenever she went out of the cottage he sighed with regret, and when she came back he cried welcome to her in his own language. Jarro forgot entirely how afraid he had been of both dogs and humans in other days. He thought now that they were gentle and kind, and he loved them. He wished that he were well, so he could fly down to Torken and tell the wild ducks that their enemies were not dangerous and that they need not fear them. He had observed that the human beings, as well as Caesar, had calm eyes, which it did one good to look into. The only one in the cottage whose glance he did not care to meet was Clavina, the house cat. She did him no harm either, but he couldn't place any confidence in her. Then, too, she quarrelled with him constantly, because he loved human beings. You think they protect you because they are fond of you, said Clavina. You just wait until you are fat enough. Then they'll wring the neck of you. I know them. I do. Jarro, like all birds, had a tender and affectionate heart, and he was unutterably distressed when he heard this. He couldn't imagine that his mistress would wish to wring the neck of him nor could he believe any such thing of her son, the little boy who sat for hours beside his basket and babbled and chattered. He seemed to think that both of them had the same love for him that he had for them. One day, when Jarro and Caesar lay on the usual spot before the fire, Clavina sat on the hearth and began to tease the wild duck. I wonder, Jarro, what you wild ducks will do next year, when Torken is strained and turned into grain fields, said Clavina. What's that you say, Clavina? cried Jarro, and jumped up, scared through and through. I always forget, Jarro, that you do not understand human speech like Caesar and myself, answered the cat or else you surely would have heard how the men who were here in the cottage yesterday said that all the water was going to be drained from Torken, and that next year the lake bottom would be as dry as a house floor and now i wonder where you wild ducks will go when jarro heard this talk he was so furious that he hissed like a snake you are just as mean as a common coot he screamed at clavina you only want to incite me against human beings i don't believe they want to do anything of the sort they must know that Torken is the wild duck's property why should they make so many birds homeless and unhappy you have certainly hit upon all this to scare me i hope that you may be torn in pieces by gorgo the eagle i hope that my mistress will chop off your whiskers but jarro couldn't shut clavina up with this outburst so you think i am lying said she ask caesar then he was also in the house last night caesar never lies see sir said jarro you understand human speech much better than clavina say that she hasn't heard aright think how it would be if the people drained Torken and changed the lake bottom into fields then there would be no more pondweed or duck food for the grown wild ducks and no blackfish or worms or gnat eggs for the ducklings then the reed banks would disappear where now the ducklings conceal themselves until they are able to fly all ducks would be compelled to move away from here and seek another home 
but where shall they find retreat like token caesar say that clavina has not heard aright it was extraordinary to watch caesar's behaviour during this conversation he had been wide awake the whole time before but now when jarro turned to him he panted laid his long nose on his forepaws and was sound asleep within the wink of an eyelid the cat looked down at caesar with a knowing smile i believe that caesar doesn't care to answer you she said to jarro it is with him as with all dogs they will never acknowledge that humans can do any wrong but you can rely upon my word at any rate i shall tell you why they wish to drain the lake just now as long as you wild ducks still had the power on token they did not wish to drain it for at least they got some good out of you but now grebs and coots and other birds who are no good as food have infested nearly all the reed banks and the people don't think they need let the lake remain on their account jarro didn't trouble himself to answer clavina but raised his head and shouted in caesar's ear caesar you know that on token there are still so many ducks left that they fill the air like clouds say it isn't true that human beings intend to make all of these homeless then caesar sprang up with such a sudden outburst at clavina that she had to save herself by jumping up on the shelf i'll teach you to keep quiet when i want to sleep bawled caesar of course i know that there is some talk about draining the lake this year but there's been talk of this many times before without anything coming out of it and that draining business is a matter in which i take no stock whatever for how would it go with the game if token were laid waste you are a donkey to gloat over a thing like that what will you and i have to amuse ourselves with when there are no more birds on token the decoy duck sunday april seventeenth a couple of days later jarro was so well that he could fly all about the house then he was petted a good deal by the mistress and the little boy ran out in the yard and plucked the first grass blades for him which had sprung up when the mistress caressed him jarro thought that although he was now so strong that he could fly down to token at any time he shouldn't care to be separated from the human beings he had no objection to remaining with them all his life but early one morning the mistress placed a halter or noose over jarro which prevented him from using his wings and then she turned him over to the farmhand who had found him in the yard the farmhand poked him under his arm and went down to token with him the ice had melted away while jarro had been ill the old dry fall leaves still stood along the shores and islets but all the water growths had begun to take root down in the deep and the green stems had already reached the surface and now nearly all the migratory birds were at home the curlews hooked bills peeped out from the reeds the grebs glided about with new feather collars around the neck and the jack snipes were gathering straws for their nests the farmhand got into a scow laid jarro in the bottom of the boat and began to pull himself out on the lake jarro who had now accustomed himself to expect only good of human beings said to caesar who was also in the party that he was very grateful toward the farmhand for taking him out on the lake but there was no need to keep him so closely guarded for he did not intend to fly away to this caesar made no reply he was very close moused that morning the only thing which struck jarro as being a bit peculiar was that the farmhand had taken his gun along he couldn't believe that any of the good folk in the cottage would want to shoot birds and besides caesar had told him that the people didn't hunt at this time of the year it is a prohibited time he had said although this doesn't concern me of course 
The farm hand went over to one of the little reed enclosed mud islets. There he stepped from the boat, gathered some old reeds into a pile, and lay down behind it. Jarrow was permitted to wander around on the ground with a halter over his wings and tethered to the boat with a long string. Suddenly Jarrow caught sight of some young ducks and drakes, in whose company he had formerly raced backward and forward over the lake. They were a long way off, but Jarrow called them to him with a couple of loud shouts. They responded, and a large and beautiful flock approached. Before they got there, Jarrow began to tell them about his marvellous rescue and of the kindness of human beings. Just then two shots sounded behind him. Three ducks sank down on the reeds, lifeless, and Caesar bounced out and captured them. Then Jarrow understood. The human beings had only saved him that they might use him as a decoy duck and they had also succeeded three ducks had died on his account he thought he should die of shame he thought that even his friend caesar looked contemptuously at him and when they came home to the cottage he didn't dare lie down and sleep beside the dog the next morning jarrow was again taken out on the shallows this time too he saw some ducks but when he observed that they flew toward him he called to them away away be careful fly in another direction there's a hunter hidden behind the reed pile i'm only a decoy bird and he actually succeeded in preventing them from coming within shooting distance jarrow had scarcely had time to taste of a grass blade so busy was he in keeping watch he called out his warning as soon as a bird drew nigh. He even warned the grebs, although he detested them, because they crowded the ducks out of their best hiding places. But he did not wish that any bird should meet with misfortune on his account. And thanks to Jarrow's vigilance, the farmhand had to go home without firing off a single shot. Despite this fact, Caesar looked less displeased than on the previous day and when evening came he took jarrow in his mouth carried him over to the fireplace and let him sleep between his forepaws nevertheless jarrow was no longer contented in the cottage but was grievously unhappy his heart suffered at the thought that humans never had loved him when the mistress of the little boy came forward to caress him he stuck his bill under his wing and pretended that he slept for several days Jarrow continued his distressful watch service, and already he was known all over Tolkien. Then it happened one morning, while he called as usual, Have a care, birds, don't come near me, I'm only a decoy duck, that a greb nest came floating toward the shallows where he was tied. This was nothing especially remarkable. It was a nest from the year before and since greb nests are built in such a way that they can move on water like boats it often happens they drift out towards the lake still jarrow stood there and stared at the nest because it came so straight toward the islet that it looked as though someone had steered its course over the water as the nest came nearer jarrow saw that a little human being the tiniest he had ever seen sat in the nest and rowed it forward with a pair of sticks and this little human called to him go as near the water as you can jarrow and be ready to fly you shall soon be freed a few seconds later the greb nest lay near land but the little oarsman did not leave it but sat huddled up between branches and straw Jarrow too held himself almost immovable. He was actually paralyzed with fear, lest the rescuer should be discovered. The next thing which occurred was that a flock of wild geese came along. Then Jarrow woke up to business and warned them with loud shrieks, but in spite of this they flew backward and forward over the shallows several times. They held themselves so high that they were beyond shooting distance still the farmhand let himself be tempted to fire a couple of shots at them 
these shots were hardly fired before the little creature ran up on land drew a tiny knife from its sheath and with a couple of quick strokes cut loose jarro's halter now fly away jarro before the man has time to load again cried he while he himself ran down to the grebe nest and pulled away from the shore the hunter had his gaze fixed upon the geese and hadn't observed that jarro had been freed but caesar had followed more carefully that which happened but just as jarro raised his wings he dashed forward and grabbed him by the neck jarro cried pitifully and the boy who had freed him said quietly to caesar if you are just as honourable as you look surely you cannot wish to force a good bird to sit here and entice others into trouble when caesar heard these words he grinned viciously with his upper lip but the next second he dropped jarro fly jarro said he you are certainly too good to be a decoy duck it wasn't for this that i wanted to keep you here but because it will be lonely in the cottage without you the lowering of the lake wednesday april twentieth it was indeed very lonely in the cottage without jarro the dog and the cat found the time long when they didn't have him to wrangle over and the housewife missed the glad quacking which he had indulged in every time she entered the house but the one who longed most for jarro was the little boy per Ola. he was but three years old and the only child and in all his life he had never had a playmate like jarro when he heard that jarro had gone back to Torken and the wild ducks he couldn't be satisfied with this but thought constantly of how he should get him back again per Ola had talked a good deal with jarro while he lay still in his basket and he was certain that a duck understood him he begged his mother to take him down to the lake that he might find jarro and persuade him to come back to them mother wouldn't listen to this but the little one didn't give up his plan on that account the day after jarro had disappeared per Ola was running about in the yard he played by himself as usual but caesar lay on the stoop and when mother let the boy out she said take care of perula caesar now if all had been as usual caesar would also have obeyed the command and the boy would have been so well guarded that he couldn't have run the least risk but caesar was not like himself these days he knew that the farmers who lived along token had held frequent conferences about the lowering of the lake and that they had almost settled the matter the ducks must leave and caesar should never more behold a glorious chase he was so preoccupied with thoughts of this misfortune that he did not remember to watch over perula and the little one had scarcely been alone in the yard a minute before he realized that now the right moment was come to go down to token and talk with jarro he opened a gate and wandered down toward the lake on the narrow path which ran along the banks as long as he could be seen from the house he walked slowly but afterward he increased his pace he was very much afraid that mother or someone else should call to him that he couldn't go he didn't wish to do anything naughty only to persuade jarro to come home but he felt that those at home would not have approved of the undertaking when perula came down to the lake shore he called jarro several times thereupon he stood for a long time and waited but no jarro appeared he saw several birds that resembled the wild duck but they flew by without noticing him and he could understand that none among them was the right one when jarro didn't come to him the little boy thought that it would be easier to find him if he went out on the lake there were several good craft lying along the shore but they were tied the only one that lay loose and at liberty was an old leaky scow which was so unfit that no one thought of using it but perula scrambled up in it without caring that the whole bottom was filled with water he had not strength enough to use the oars but instead he seated himself to swing and rock in the scow 
certainly no grown person would have succeeded in moving a scow out on token in that manner but when the tide is high and ill luck to the fore little children have a marvellous faculty for getting out to sea per ola was soon riding around on token and calling for jarro when the old scow was rocked like this out to sea its cracks opened wider and wider and the water actually streamed into it per ola didn't pay the slightest attention to this he sat upon the little bench in front and called to every bird he saw and wondered why jarro didn't appear at last jarro caught sight of per ola he heard that someone called him by the name which he had borne among human beings and he understood that the boy had gone out on token to search for him jarro was unspeakably happy to find that one of the human beings really loved him he shot down toward perula like an arrow seated himself beside him and let him caress him they were both very happy to see each other again but suddenly jarro noticed the condition of the scow it was half filled with water and was almost ready to sink jarro tried to tell perula that he who could neither fly nor swim must try to get upon land but perula didn't understand him then jarro did not wait an instant but hurried away to get help jarro came back in a little while and carried on his back a tiny thing who was much smaller than perula himself if he hadn't been able to talk and move the boy would have believed that it was a doll instantly the little one ordered perula to pick up a long slender pool that lay in the bottom of the scow and try to pull it toward one of the reed islands perula obeyed him and he and the tiny creature together steered the scow with a couple of strokes they were on the little reed encircled island and now perula was told that he must step on land and just the very moment that perula set foot on land the scow was filled with water and sank to the bottom when perula saw this he was sure that father and mother would be very angry with him he would have started in to cry if he hadn't found something else to think about soon namely a flock of big grey birds who lighted on the island the little midget took him up to them and told him their names and what they said and this was so funny that perula forgot everything else meanwhile the folks on the farm had discovered that the boy had disappeared and had started to search for him they searched the outhouses looked in the well and hunted through the cellar then they went out into the highways and bypaths wandered to the neighboring farm to find out if he had strayed over there and searched for him also down by token but no matter how much they sought they did not find him caesar the dog understood very well that the farmer folk were looking for perula but he did nothing to lead them on the right track instead he lay still as though the matter didn't concern him later in the day perula's footprints were discovered down by the boat landing and then came the thought that the old leaky scow was no longer on the strand then one began to understand how the whole affair had come about the farmer and his helpers immediately took out the boats and went in search of the boy they rowed around on token until way late in the evening without seeing the least shadow of him they couldn't help believing that the old scow had gone down and that the little one lay dead on the lake bottom in the evening perula's mother hunted around on the strand everyone else was convinced that the boy was drowned but she could not bring herself to believe this she searched all the while she searched between reeds and bulrushes tramped and tramped on the muddy shore never thinking of how deep her foot sank and how wet she had become she was unspeakably desperate her heart ached in her breast she did not weep but wrung her hands and called for her child in loud piercing tones round about her she heard swans and ducks and curlews shrieks she thought that they followed her and moaned and wailed they too surely they too must be in trouble since they moan so thought she 
Then she remembered. These were only birds that she heard complain. They surely had no worries. It was strange that they did not quiet down after sunset. But she heard all these uncountable bird throngs, which lived along Token, send forth cry upon cry. Several of them followed her wherever she went. Others came rustling past on light wings. All the air was filled with moans and lamentations. But the anguish which she herself was suffering opened her heart. She thought that she was not as far removed from all other living creatures as people usually think. She understood much better than ever before how birds fared. They had their constant worries for home and children, they as she. There was surely not such a great difference between them and her as she had heretofore believed. Then she happened to think that it was as good as settled that these thousands of swans and ducks and loons would lose their homes here by token. It will be very hard for them, she thought. Where shall they bring up their children now? She stood still and mused on this. It appeared to be an excellent and agreeable accomplishment to change a lake into fields and meadows. But let it be some other lake than Token, some other lake, which was not the home of so many thousand creatures. She remembered how on the following day the proposition to lower the lake was to be decided, and she wondered if this was why her little son had been lost just today. Was it God's meaning that sorrow should come and open her heart just today? before it was too late to avert the cruel act. She walked rapidly up to the house and began to talk with her husband about this. She spoke of the lake and of the birds, and said that she believed it was God's judgment on them both, and she soon found that he was of the same opinion. They already owned a large place, but if the lake draining was carried into effect, such a goodly portion of the lake bottom would fall to their share that their property would be nearly doubled. For this reason they had been more eager for the undertaking than any of the other shore owners. The others had been worried about expenses, and anxious lest the draining should not prove any more successful this time than it was the last. Perola's father knew in his heart that it was he who had influenced them to undertake the work. He had exercised all his eloquence, so that he might leave to his son a farm as large again as his father had left to him. He stood and pondered if God's hand was back of the fact that Token had taken his son from him on the day before he was to draw up the contract to lay it waste. The wife didn't have to say many words to him before he answered. It may be that God does not want us to interfere with his order. I'll talk with the others about this tomorrow, and I think we'll conclude that all may remain as it is. While the farmer folk were talking this over, Caesar lay before the fire. He raised his head and listened very attentively. When he thought that he was sure of the outcome, he walked up to the mistress, took her by the skirt, and led her to the door. But see, sir, said she, and wanted to break loose. Do you know where Perula is? she exclaimed. Caesar barked joyfully and threw himself against the door. She opened it, and Caesar dashed down toward Token. The mistress was so positive he knew where Perula was that she rushed after him and no sooner had they reached the shore than they heard a child's cry out on the lake. Perula had had the best day of his life in company with Thumbitot and the birds, but now he had begun to cry because he was hungry and afraid of the darkness, and he was glad when father and mother and Caesar came for him. End of the Big Bird Lake Read by Lars Rolander.